means that even with social distancing, radio ads can still be made and broadcast safely. Radio. Business as usual. Even when it's not business as usual. For more information, email info at fmjunction.ie. Describe Maynooth University in three words. Skills for life. Gives you choice. Young, bold, progressive. You're in control. Feel so happy. Choose the university that puts you first. Best decision ever. Online Open Day, April 25th. Visit openday.maynoothuniversity.ie. Maynooth University. No, no bounds. COVID-19 is a major public health emergency here in Ireland and around the world. It's having a big impact on every aspect of our lives. We are now asked to stay at home with limited exceptions. This is especially hard for older people and those who've been advised to cocoon. Being isolated from friends and family is hard for everyone. So right now, it's important that we look out for each other and look after our neighbours. That's why national government, local government and the community and voluntary sectors have all come together to create the Community Call. To make sure that anyone who needs help can get help. And to make sure that people who would like to volunteer in their community can help where they are most needed. If you need help, if you know someone who needs help, or if you'd like to offer help, please call 0818 222 024 or call your local authority Community Call Helpline. All the details are live now at gov.ie. Supported by the Government of Ireland. At Spar, we're always changing to meet the needs of our customers. And right now, things are changing quite quickly for all of us. So, we want to reassure you that we're working hard to make sure things don't change when it comes to getting what you need in your local Spar. Every day, thousands of our staff keep Spar stores all over the country open, stocked and safe. Our supply chain and delivery team is strong throughout the communities we serve. Whatever changes we face together, you'll find what you need under the tree at Spar. Cancer doesn't stop and neither will we. The Irish Cancer Society's support line is open every day to help anyone worried or affected by cancer. For information on any cancer-related issue, including concerns about coronavirus, advice on financial or employment matters, or to arrange free cancer counselling, please call us. Get in touch at free phone 1800 200 700 or at cancer.ie. Apart but not alone. Off the ball. This is is News Talk. And you're very welcome back to Off the Ball Saturday on News Talk. John Duggan with you through to five o'clock. Uh, 53106 for your text messages. We're also streaming live now, uh, so you can watch us on the Off the Ball social channels, on Facebook, on YouTube, on Twitter. You can tweet us at Off the Ball as our handle there. Our special guest this week is a household name who's going to talk over the next hour about his love of sports. So to introduce him, a 13 time winner at the Imro Radio Awards. A former actor in Glen Rowe, a comedian, an impressionist, <laughs> a companion every morning for two decades on the Today FM's Ian Dempsey Breakfast Show, uh, an all-round legend, all-round good guy, Mario Rosenstock. Good afternoon. Hi, John. How are you? And hello to all the listeners out there and the viewers. I hope you're all staying safe at home and uh, let's get this on for the next hour. Absolutely. How are you and your family? In normal circumstances, Mario, you'd be touring the country with this gift grub live. That's right. I'm, I'm in the middle of a tour at the moment. That never happens, John. And... <laughs> Uh, and I, I was brilliant last night. My performance was fantastic last night. I was in the Olympia last night, I think. And uh, no, I wasn't. And uh, listen, it's been put back to September and October. And some people have been saying, well, you'll be lucky if it has, because um, who knows what's going to happen. But um, listen, it, it is what it is. And um, I, I'm almost guilty by saying it, but I'm, believe it or not, I'm, I whisper it gently, but I'm really enjoying the lockdown. And uh, so far, anyway, because uh, it's given me great time at home with the family and uh, with Dash and Bellamy, uh, my two kids and Blonde, my wife. And um, I st I'm still on the breakfast show every morning with Ian and I'm still doing the Sunday roast um, on Sunday. So I'm, I'm busy still. So um, this, the combination of a bit of work and the family is so far so good. And routine still important, though. Oh, routine is everything for human beings, really. You know, we're all like children, really. And. We're all like little kids and, and we all need our routine, John. And if, if we can do whatever we can to keep that routine going, it'll 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 um, serve us better in the long run, especially on the old, um, as they say, mental health front. You know, the routine is, is absolutely vital. 
I must disclose to everyone, we're good pals for a long uh, period of time. We've been to some matches together, great days, Liverpool, Man United, mm. the Grand <laughs> Slam game at Twickenham. Um, I've always been badgering you, Mario, to do a podcast. I suppose this is episode one. And uh, for those viewing yeah. uh, this uh, new podcast, well, actually, it's off the ball Saturday on News Talk. You're wearing, it looks like a Celtic jersey. Yes, uh, I'm not going to tell you the story of that until later in this um, episode. Okay. So, uh, but I'm, I, I, there is a brilliant story behind this um, behind this uh, shirt. And uh, no, to echo what you said, we are great mates, and we've known each other for 20 years, and we've had some extremely exciting adventures together. We've been abroad, and um, and and of course, one of the things I love about you most, John, is not just your sports thing; it's your ability to talk American politics. Um, and I love chatting to you about American politics all the way back to, you know, the, the pre-Kennedy days and through Lyndon Johnson and Jimmy Carter and Nixon and Watergate and, and all the president's men and Reagan and, and, and Clinton and Bush and now Trump. Yeah, it's, it's pretty, uh, it's pretty, it's cool when you can have all these kind of weird interests that kind of, kind of uh, coagulate with people um, and then people pick up off other people's strange interests about different things like I'm into 80s music and weird uh, cinema and that kind of thing and uh, I suppose it's like, uh, Steve, it's like Steve Davis the way you go is he just a boring snooker player no he's he's into northern soul and you go oh my god he's he's because Steve Davis is a fascinating character we're all missing sport Mario badly and I think one of the mm. one of the things that kind of brought it all home to me was the Masters coming and going last week yeah the Masters, um, the Masters. I've you and I have talked about the Masters before, and I explained to you once how you asked me what I thought of the Masters, and I went, "It's the first smell, the first glimpse, the first sign of summer that we get on planet Earth, really, from our little vantage point in Ireland." And that first weekend in April, when you see the early pictures coming in from from um, Magnolia Lane and 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 Georgia and you see the azaleas in full bloom and you see the sun coming up and you know that it's it's not roasting but it's it's warm enough it's spring summer weather there and um, it's our first glimpse in Ireland of what the summer holds for us at uh, this long long seven eight month period of, of great glorious sport that we will have and now of course the masters this institution um, uh, it, it will not take place and may take place only in, in November, as, as we heard, which will be very strange. And as Rory McIlroy said, it will be much um, cooler and um, uh, it will be much different conditions the, to play um, the Masters in November if it goes ahead. It'll probably play much longer as a course and it's already very long and that'll suit long hitters like Rory and DJ. Um, perhaps Bubba Watson again, um, these enormous hitters who it'll, it'll suit. But no, the Masters is... I've, I've always wondered, actually, as a big fan of golf myself, I've always wondered what the greatest tournament in the world is. And you're a huge f fan of golf, John, and it's never been it's never been made clear to me. What's the number one tournament in the world? You will hear people say, oh, it's the Open Championship, the Open, the Open Championship, not the British Open, the Open Championship. And then you will, you will hear other people say, well, no, it's the Masters. The Masters is the greatest tournament in golf. And I have heard other people say, no, it's the US Open. The US Open is the greatest tournament in golf because it is the greatest test of international golfers. Um, and so I've never, obviously it's not the PGA, but um, I, would, I would wonder, would you have any opinions on that yourself? If, I, if, if, yeah. if you're a golfer and you have, to, if you're a golfer and you can only win one major in your career, which one is it? The Open Championship. Um, is it? I've been to six of them. I think the Masters is a little bit more elitist. I'm not too keen on some of the history of the club. Um, I do love that. I think the Masters is getting bigger and bigger and bigger every year. That's because maybe um, the, the beauty of the Masters is that it is in the one place every year. And uh, there's the green jacket. There's all the ceremony. And I suppose with society uh, uh, very much individual now, uh, the, the, the actual tradition, it reminds us of a time maybe when life was simpler. Uh, when it was just Sunday nights with the curtains closed, with Miles Dungan and with the jumpers and with um, this certainty of this thing that happened every single year. And then you've got European uh, players winning it like Sandy Lyle, Seve, Olathebal, Woosnam Faldo. And, and, and Faldo. And you're thinking, we can do this. We can actually w go over there to America and win this. So it was this, and that, that has remained, that tradition, the sameness of it, Tiger Woods, uh, whereas everything in the world has changed. And I think that's why the Masters has actually... Um, increased its luster, uh, even the butler cabin, the weird ceremonies, all that kind of thing. But I do think, Mario, the Open, having been to six of them, 
Uh, there's something very democratic about it, the qualifying system for us. You, back to Mr. Lou and Lee Trevino, uh, Shane Larry uh, winning on the island of Ireland, Paul de Carrington winning it, the way the game is played over here, which was the original way the game was played. Uh, I, I just think there's something quite democratic about it, that the wind will tell you how difficult the week is going to be. The wind blows, it could be five under par. If wind doesn't blow, it's 18 under par. And it's quite cheap to get into it. You follow people around. There's a democracy to the Open, which I still think uh, makes it the best tournament. Yeah, similarly, there'd probably be a similar democracy to the US Open, where technically any professional golf player um, or any per, any pro member of a, a big club can technically enter. Like Tin Cup, member Kevin Costa, yeah. um, can enter the US Open and you can you can technically go through all these pre-qualifiers and become the the American champion um, uh, uh, of golf. Um, but no, and of course, our special um, our special appreciation and connection with the with the, the British with the Open, of course, Porik, winning it in in, in um, 07 and and 08, and establishing that beginning of that incredible phase, which still goes on today, of Irish players winning. Um, major tournaments and it had never it you know we hadn't done it since wasn't it Fred Daly wasn't it 1947 that, that yeah Fred Daly was the last one and then suddenly Porrick starts and then Darren and then Rory and then Graham and now Shane and it's just absolutely incredible and having the Ryder Cup here as well and yeah um, I think it's really it's a great sport uh, for bluffers like us to to talk about and uh, get the text machine going for four hours because it is to me golf is Hollywood drama. It's one. Of, it, it is not a sport to be honest. That's great to watch in the flesh. A lot of crowds. You got ropes. Tricky to see things. It's difficult to follow the the, the pace of the player. What's happening? It is a television sport, uh, but it is just Hollywood drama. Jordan Spieth, the way he won the Masters, the way he threw away the Masters. Yeah. Um, you've got four days of it. It's a roller coaster and. Uh, it is a great challenge of a mental ability of somebody. And also, the, the way the game is played, the gentlemanly side of the game, Jack Nicholas, Tom Watson, these legends. and Yes, uh, or not, in the case of someone like, let's say, Patrick Reed, Patrick Reed or, villain, yeah. or, or somebody in the case of Tiger Woods at times, yeah. um, whose behaviour on and off the course has let him down. I mean, I, I still... I, I, st I still have this image of Tiger Woods spitting all over courses, and it really, really annoys me the the way he has um, kind of abused his own, um, disrespected his own game in, in, in many respects. And it goes back to that thing I remember you saying, and you said it many times to me and, and on air as well, how you believe Tiger Woods is the greatest uh, player in world in um, golf, in golfing history, but that Jack Nicklaus is the greatest champion. Yeah. And I couldn't, I couldn't agree with you more um, because... Having read a little bit about Nicholas and studied a little bit about him and watched him a little, I'm so, so impressed by the man, um, even though he probably wouldn't be from the same political um, affiliations as I might um, like. Um, I still would love him as a man. And I loved the way he conducted himself during his career and how, as far as I can make out, he put character first and he put his family first um, and golf came second. And yet he won all these majors. Um, 18 majors he won, but I think the most um, telling statistic about Jack Nicholas is the fact that he was either first or second in a major 37 times. That is one of the most extraordinary, extraordinary statistics ever in world sport. Um, winning the Masters in Augusta in 1986 at 46 years of age, truly um, extraordinary. And I remember hearing Nicholas talk once about what it was like to be, to win, how hard it was to win. And I, I remember it being very, very interested by this because they said, Jack, how, how, how did you win all these majors? And Jack said, it wasn't that hard for me to win these majors. And they went, what? That's an extraordinary thing to say. And he says, no, he said winning tournaments was harder. Ordinary tournaments, ordinary tour tournaments. And they said, why? And he said, because when I entered the Canadian Open uh, of an average year, 53, 54 guys think they can win that tournament. And I'm up against 53, 54 guys. But when I entered the U.S. Masters, only three or four guys really believe they can win that tournament. So I'm only effectively up against three or four people. And when I'm coming down that home stretch and I play, as he always said, within myself, within myself, he always talked about playing within himself. He knows that the other guys will blow themselves up and he'll be left uh, either first or around there or thereabouts. And I thought that was very, very interesting that Jack Nicklaus found winning majors easier than winning golf tournaments. Yeah, because it's in the mind, isn't it? And uh, he wasn't a popular guy, Jack Nicholas, when he came out in the tour first. He was called Ohio Fats. And Arnold mm. Palmer was the king. And he took the king's crown. 
And it wasn't until a few years later that Jack became to become loved. And then he was just loved in the best way when he won that Masters at the age of 46 in 1986. Yeah, he was loved in that way as well. Like that's that, that older ten older players become yeah. loved. Yeah. You start off as a brute and you start off as this man who hits it further than everybody and everybody's gone. Oh, he wins all the time and he's boring. So you're Steve Davis or you're Boris Becker or you're Rafael Nadal. Um, and after a while, then the public soften towards you because you become older and you become somebody that they root for in the end. I remember um, the, 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 what you're talking about there. Nicholas was a Ohio Fats because he was a little bit overweight, but he was a bruiser as well. And um, I remember then in the 70s, he lost all his weight. Remember when he lost all the weight yeah. and he became slimmer and he got a kind of a Beach Boys haircut. And it totally changed his image. And the Jack Nicholas of uh, Baltus role, I remember, in about 1980, was a totally different Jack Nicholas than the early 60s. And by the time he hits Augusta in 86, uh, he's truly everybody's, uh, you know, everybody's favorite uncle at that stage. And everybody's rooting for him. But I've always had a soft spot for Jack Nicholas. Um, and I would always love to think that he is as real a deal as um, he comes across as. Similarly with Tom Watson. I've always been impressed by Tom Watson as well about what kind of a gentleman he seems to have been. I don't know, would you agree, John, or with that? Tom Watson, uh, I'm not so sure about Tom Watson. I, I would mm. put him in the same bracket uh, as Jack Nicholas, uh, mm. not, not in terms of him being a gentleman or not, but just in terms of my reverence for him. Uh, Jack Nicholas like, came to Ireland, I think I remember in the 80s, like, I think uh, it was at Killeen Castle he was heavily involved with. And uh, he's just... To me, he's just uh, the, the doyen, the gentleman. And I love uh, when he hosts that tournament, the Memorial Tournament in, in Ohio, um, Muirfield Village, which he called after Muirfield, which he won the 1966 Open at. Uh, and uh, to me, he's, he's the godfather of golf. And Tiger Woods has been, to me, the best player ever. And uh, that 15-shot win for, for Tiger Woods in 2000 at Pebble Beach is uh, still the best golf I've ever seen as, as a spectator. Um, and I don't play, and it's a strange one. I, I, I kind of feel sometimes I'm a bit of a cheater in that I don't play golf because I'm no good mm. at it. And I get blisters in my hands, I get hay fever. It's, it's just something I'm not very good at. Um, <laughs> but it's something I love watching because I love the mental challenge of golf. And even Harrington, when he won that first Open, putting it in the burn at Carnoustie and then coming back to win. Uh, Tiger last year just intimidating everybody in that red uh, shirt to win the Masters. And uh, to, to me, it's a roller coaster of emotions. Um, yeah. But you are a golfer, and sometimes you get invited to Pro-Ams. I'm sure you've hobnobbed with the, the stars uh, that are also in the A-list uh, like yourself? I did, um, <laughs> I hardly think that now. I did, I, I, I've given up golf a little bit, John, I would have to say, because uh, my connection with golf it was largely actually through Tony Fenton. Tony um, uh, played a good game of golf. I think he got it down to about 11, 11 or 10 at one stage on the handicap, which is pretty good. And I got it down to about 13. And uh, Tony and I used to head off at 5.30 in the morning and play in Carton House on a Sunday morning. And, and uh, we, we, we'd, we'd get on the buggies and complete the course in about two hours and 45 minutes. So it was more like polo than anything else. But uh, Tony was um, Tony was a, a nice, languid, swinging golfer. And I remember at one stage we got invited to the Irish Open in Carton House and we got to uh, play in the Pro-Am. And... Uh, Lo and behold, anyway, we were we were um, delighted to be involved in this pro am, and uh, we got to play with uh, the Dutch player Just Louten, yeah. and uh, who's 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 still now a top pro, like you know, in Europe. And uh, I remember uh, we had a great round with Just Louten, and Tony and I played quite well actually, because sometimes when you play with a player who's much better than yourself, you sort of fall into their rhythm, and you can actually play outside yourself and play above yourself. And I was playing quite well anyway, and at one stage Tony was playing well. Um, but on the let's say the thirteenth tee or something, Tony drove the ball and he hooked it a violent snap hook to the left. And um, the first thing Tony said is he looked at the ball and he just saw it in the air and he went, "Ah, oh, Jesus! I pulled the knickers off that one." <laughs> and suddenly, Juice Louton burst out laughing, and it was just this, you know, burst out laughing. He was say, "What did you say there, Tony? This is very funny. What did you say? Uh, it was like my Epstein impression from many years ago." What did you say, Tony? I said I pulled the knickers off it, Juiced. <laughs> and I went, pulled the knickers off it? This is fantastic. I love this one. So anyway, we go on, we shake hands, and we had a lovely day with Juiced. But a year later, I'm watching Sky Sports, and um, it's a uh, British Masters or some tournament in Europe. And, and now we go to Juiced Loudon on the 14th tee. Pew. And all I can hear in the background is Juiced gone. Oh, Jesus, I pulled the knickish <laughs> off that one. And I'm, oh, my God. He's actually remembered Tony's 
um, catchphrase from a year ago and he took it with him on tour. And it was absolutely hilarious to hear Juice Luton, um, who, who, who was, um, who was uh, saying one of Tony's old, old, old expressions. What a fantastic. The dude, um, yeah. the dude, the dude, the dude, Tony. What a lovely golfer he was as well. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, uh, that's uh, that's funny stuff. That's funny stuff. And uh, I yeah. suppose the surprise of it as well. Like, what, what did he actually say that? Uh, and you're kind of you're second guessing yourself. Did, 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 did yeah. you just let Max? I heard him say, "I pulled the knickers off that one." Because <laughs> <laughs> he obviously loved the expression so much, he he, he adopted just see, it. Just going to go uh, to the, the Oxford English Dictionary and like looking up the word knickers um, after you're around with him, um, and then I'm going to put that in my in my repertoire. And you you wonder how many times he's actually said it. Um, the golf the golf is interesting, John. We could we could talk about golf all day yeah. because I, every before every major tournament, I usually um, text you. And I usually say, um, John, what's the big story this weekend? So in other words, what would be the big story or the, th- the top three stories? And you usually uh, text me back and, and then we, we, we sort of go back and forth about what the big story would be. But at the moment, I'm thinking one of the big stories in golf, and it's going to remain a big story in golf until it's solved. And that is whether Rory McIlroy can ever win a um, U.S. Masters green jacket. I personally think he'll win two of them. Um, but the question is, um, when will he do it and if he'll do it? Because his game is perfectly suited to the shape of Augusta and his length is perfectly suited. And um, But it's just this incredible psychological... I've always compared him to a thoroughbred racehorse, Rory. He always reminds me of a thoroughbred flat racehorse, um, that his temperament is has, it has to be spot on. And when his temperament is spot on, he's Lam Tara, he's Shergar. He's uh, he he's just he's secretariat. There is just no catching Rory McIlroy when he's in the zone, but he needs to be in the zone to to do it. Rory McIlroy doesn't generally win te- golf tournaments playing okay. Tiger Woods won many golf tournaments playing Tiger's B game. Rory McIlroy doesn't win for me many golf tournaments playing his B game, but when Rory plays his A game, nobody can live with Rory McIlroy. Ever and you you can tell as well. Remember yeah. the, the thor- thoroughbred racehorse I talked about there. You can tell when a thoroughbred racehorse is happy. It's jaunty. Its ears are pricked. It's aware of its surroundings. It looks around. My uncles who are mad into racing used to always say that horse knows where he is. Now of course the horse doesn't know where he is, but it's an old expression in racing. The horse knows where he is. It's as if to say that the horse has some sort of intuitive intelligence that puts him above other horses. And Rory is like a horse who knows where he is when he's playing well. You see his um, shoulders are, 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 are rocking. His chest is out. He's looking around. He's mobile. When Rory is down, his body language is closed. His head goes down. His chin goes down and he's sunken. Um, and it's that famous photograph of him in 2010 when he slumped over the bag, I think, after driving it off, to, off the 10th tee in, in, yeah. in, in Augusta on the final round. And he drove it into the cabins. And uh, the tournament was over. And so the quest, one of the big questions in golf is, will Rory McIlroy ever win a U.S. Masters? Will Tiger Woods ever win a 16th, 17th or 18th yeah. um, major? Um, yeah. I think Rory will win a Masters because of his age. I think he's young enough. He's, what, just turning 31. I think he's yeah. got 10 years to do it. I think he'll be just too good and he'll shoot 65 and stay in the clubhouse and other players will falter behind him. Uh, but when you're talking about um, the way somebody... Uh, carries himself and I think this probably uh, is, is part of why you're so observant and you're so good at picking up mannerisms for impressions. Uh, when I'm looking at Roger Federer, one of your heroes, I'm not seeing any uh, emotion really until he wins. Uh, why is Roger Federer the man in tennis? Why not uh, Nadal? Why not Djokovic? Why Federer? Why is Federer the, the god for you? I grew up, um, I was born in 1970 and I was brought up on a farm in Waterford and uh, colour television um, in the mid to late 70s became, came into people's houses and I was would watch Wimbledon. And that kind of coincided with what pe- many people argue is one of the greatest eras of men's and indeed possibly women's professional tennis as well. And that is the era of uh, Bjorn Borg, John McEnroe, uh, Jimmy Connors, Vitas Gerolaitis, Guillermo Vilas, uh, Roscoe Tanner, etc., etc. And Borg was my hero. And Borg and McEnroe were the ultimate expression of sporting rivalry, actually. Here's a great book, um, if anybody wants to get it. It's called Bur- Borg versus McEnroe, um, The Rivalry. It's a great book. Not easy to pick up, but um, it's a great book about the rivalry between Borg versus McEnroe. They didn't play that often, um, believe it or not, even though it's one of the greatest rivalries in, in, in world tennis. 
And so um, then I, I, I played tennis myself and I played to a reasonable level and I enjoyed it and I was a reasonable junior. And But then Roger Federer came along and he won junior Wimbledon, I think, about 1998. And ever since then, um, since Federer beat uh, Sampras in, I think, 2001 or something, uh, 2001, I think it was, in Wimbledon, uh, I've been I've been re- looking at Federer and I I regard him as the greatest tennis player of all time, which is uh, nothing revolutionary to say. He is the greatest tennis player of all time, not by his numbers uh, necessarily, although his numbers are the highest. It's from what he's brought to the game. When a normal person who doesn't know what tennis is about looks at Roger Federer playing, they're drawn to him because they go, oh, God, he's amazing. The way he hits his shots. So Federer is so beautiful to watch playing tennis and is filled with so much serenity and grace that ordinary people who have no interest in tennis are drawn to watching him. Just as ordinary people who have no interest in boxing were drawn to Muhammad Ali, just as no, just as ordinary people who have no interest in soccer were drawn to George Best and Diego Maradona. He is transcending the sport. He goes beyond sport. Um, then there's the other side to him. There is the, the Jack Nicholas side to him. And the Jack Nicholas side to him is what he does for the game of tennis and how he represents himself on and off the court. And on the court, Federer is a gentleman. He is a tough competitor, but he is a, a decent, a decent competitor. Off the court, he is intelligent, funny, um, ordinary. And I think this is one of the key words about Federer. Federer is a genius an absolute genius and there's no other way to describe him that he is a genius being somebody who's able to do something at such a proficient level that it's even beyond our kind of imaginations how he does it and yet even though he's a genius he is a normal normal person and it always uh, struck me as being an interesting point about Federer that there are cranks you get in pubs and people who kind of live under this sort of um, delusion I think that to be a genius you need to have a fatal flaw, that you need to be bad, wrong, misled, uh, uh, un- badly weighted in some other area. Things to so go for, wrong, like an Alex Higgins or a Gaza or a George, George Best. Best. Yeah, George yeah. Best, an awful alcoholic. Well, what a player. Um, um, you know, uh, where did it all go wrong, George? But he was a genius. Oh, your man was a terrible so-and-so. He was a this and a that, but he was a genius. Rubbish, absolute rubbish. Genius has nothing to do and is not weighted on either side by what you are like as a person. Federer is the complete example of that. Um, A person who is just gifted beyond belief, but yet is a completely normal person in everyday life. Um, One of the, remember Federer does very, very interesting um, uh, press conferences as well because he's unusually candid in press conference, more candid than Tiger Woods would ever be. Um, he reminds me a little bit of Rory McIlroy, that Rory McIlroy is quite loose. He, he, he speaks his mind. I remember once Federer being asked um, by a journalist in a big press conference, and it's like, Roger, listen, can I ask you a simple question? How do you how do you play these shots, these amazing shots so consistently? And Federer thought about it for a second, and without any sense of irony, he looked at the journalist and he said, how do I do this? Well, obviously, he said, I have an incredible talent. And everybody giggled in the room. But Federer wasn't saying it as a mark of, um, as a boastful or, or an immodest remark. He was saying it as a matter of fact that when you weigh everything up, my talent actually is a huge part of it. And I have an enormous talent. But then he started talking about his work ethic and how much he practices. And he works like a demon. Um, and Federer, like I would tell you, I love the sport. Federer loves the sport. Really, really, really loves the sport. Um, and, uh, he is, yeah. he is, he's amazing. I, I, I said to you, I knew I'd be talk, talking about Federer today. So I said, I'd get this for you. Um, people who love tennis and love reading about tennis, um, might be familiar with a journalist, a famous journalist and, um, author called David Foster Wallace and David Foster Wallace was a novelist and he died. He committed suicide in, um, not so a few years ago and he was a novelist from New York. But he was a successful junior tennis player as well. And he had a love affair with tennis and subsequently a love affair with watching Robert uh, Roger Federer. And he wrote a seminal epochal essay called 
Roger Federer as a religious experience. And it's one of the um, New York Times all time um, most viewed sports articles, even though it was written by a by a by a, uh, a writer. And uh, I have a little quote here from it's a very long article, but one lovely yeah. um, piece that he writes. And he goes, a top athlete's beauty is next impossible to describe directly or to evoke. Federer's forehand is a great liquid whip. His backhand, a one hander that can drive flat, load with topspin or slice. The slice with such snap that the ball turns shapes in the air and skids on the grass to maybe ankle height. His serve has world class pace and a degree of placement and variety no one else comes close to. The service motion is lithe and unexcentric, distinctive only in a certain eel-like body snap at the moment of impact. His anticipation and court sense are otherworldly, and his footwork is the best in the game. As a child, he was a soccer prodigy. All this is true, and yet none of it really explains anything or evokes the experience of watching this man play, of witnessing firsthand the beauty and genius of his game. You more have to come at the aesthetic stuff obliquely to talk around it or as Aquinas did with his own ineffable subject, to try and get your head literally around it. That's love, Mario. That is complete that's, love of, of yeah. Roger Federer. Um, and and uh, that is that is real observation. And um, what, what I was kind of thinking about, uh, just chatting to you, I'm kind of thinking about everybody in Irish football that you do. You do Dunphy, you do Giles, you do Roy Keane, you do Duffer, you do um, Liam Brady, Robbie Keane, <laughs> Brian Kerr, Mick, Stan. What is it that uh, you do to get um, uh, these things executed so that they work? Is it just your talent? Is it observation? When you're writing a sketch, does the melody happen first and then the words, or is it the words and then the melody? It's the melody. You're right. That's a good, actually, analogy, and it's never been put to me like that. It's a melody. It's the sound. So I remember um, I remember actually uh, myself and Ian talking about it once, um, Jose Mourinho had just become uh, manager of Chelsea and we were sitting up in the office and this was the old days in Abbey Street when we used to be able to smoke uh, in our offices uh, and uh, eat burgers in the offices and just hang around our own offices. And I remember Ian going, um, God, it'd be great if we could get Jose, wouldn't it? And I just suddenly started going, and he went, what are you doing? I went, I think that's his sound. That's his sound. That's his sound. La, 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 la. It was literally a musical note. And Ian went, you got him, you got him, you got him. You got him, go on, go on, say other stuff. And I started talking a bit and I thought that the Portuguese accent was quite Slavic and it was a little, a little bit like a Balkan accent. And I started doing him. And then, of course, that was the sound of Jose. But then after the sound of Jose, you needed to come up with something to do with him. So myself and Ian were chatting about him. And uh, we thought that this guy, of course, was just uber cool, super cool. And we went, how can you make a character appear super cool? So I almost kind of painted him as a kind of a Julio Iglesias lounge <laughs> singer. <laughs> that Jose that Jose was just this effortless lounge singer. That Chelsea would be there like nil all at halftime, really sweating. And then he'd come into the dressing room, sit down in his chair and just sing a little song. And after he sang a little song and looked at him lovingly, they would go out and be somebody for nil, beat somebody for nil. So I painted him as this kind of uh, Latin, cooler than cool lounge singer who just sing and everything would be all right. He was magical. And of course, sport is about magic. And uh, Jose was magic. But I, I love them. Um, you know, you know, characters come from in different ways. I mean, um, you know, I, I remember Brian Kerr. Brian Kerr is, is brilliant, but Brian is a visual as well because Brian has this, you know, the smiley eyes. You know what I mean? Brian kind of has the little the eyes, the slitty eyes. They're very smiley, you know. And uh, I, you know, I always thought that he was kind of a, a human embodiment of kind of a football version of Aslan. You know, <laughs> these are the hands of a tired man. Um, brilliant um, voice on him. You know, we, He's on later so, on as well, actually, on, on our World Cup series. He's a great man. He is. He is an intelligent fella, loves music and um, and, and, and a liver of life. Um, but, I mean, then sometimes we, we bastardize uh, characters. We turn something, we turn a character from something that it is into something that it isn't. So we, you, you, you bend characters slightly. So I've always played Robbie Kane as kind of a hoodlum. This fella who's on the run from the law. And he's always looking around going, the cops are going to get me head down. Uh, so, uh, so, you know, we play Robbie like a guy who's on the run. And 
you know, I, I play Brian O'Driscoll as, a, you know, a guy who likes to use um, polysyllabic words like rambunctious and remonst- remonst- remonstrating with the referee. And every sentence that he says is usually sponsored by a large major corporation like Zanussi or, you know, Harvey Norman GoPros. So, um, <laughs> and, uh, sorry, I'm getting a bit touchy there with off the ball there. That's I'm getting a bit too, sailing a bit close to the wind there, John. Yeah, he's in the other stable. Characters. He's in the stable. Uh, other, other characters though. Um, other characters. Love doing Johnny Johnny Sexton. We do Johnny Sexton as well. We've sort of played Johnny Sexton as a 14 year old sort of brat who's always on Fortnite and has a big head on him because he just wants to be left alone. <laughs> Shut up, will you? And it's like Johnny's just there, like Shut up, old man. And everybody's an old man. Just leave me alone. Let me take the kick. He's like, Johnny, Johnny, I just want to, you know, just take the kick. Stop looking at me. I can't do it when you look at me, old man. So we kind of play Johnny as I hope a, he takes it the this... right way. I hope he takes it the right way. <laughs> well, he's, I remember meeting Johnny, actually, and he's, he, did you ever get this um, thing where you meet somebody and uh, they're either surprisingly smaller or bigger than you thought? And Johnny's much bigger than I thought. He's, he must be approaching six foot three. He stands up straight. Um, but he's because Johnny Sexton is in a sport where every, uh, there's a lot of big, big people. He doesn't seem as big as he is, but he's a huge guy. He's a big, big man. Yeah. Um, but you know, listen. I mean, the sports thing is just incredible for for impressions because uh, because of the color of of, of sporting people. They're the they're, they're they're so colorful. And you were a handy footballer when you were young. Well, I'd like to think so, John. We all, we all, we all have great images of ourselves as football. I, I was playing football from five, and I played all through school, and I, I played in the schoolboys league in Waterford for a great club called Bolton. And of course, Waterford has a massive history of 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 soccer. And I grew up with my granddad talking about the great Paddy Code, and Paddy Code played for Waterford United, and of course, um, Ireland. And Paddy Code is. You know, you'll hear Dunphy say, Paddy Cowd, the great players, Tommy Eglinton, Tommy Eglinton, Paddy Cowd. And um, Paddy Cowd would have been one of the great players. And I would have remembered my grandfather, you know, describing to me being in Kilcone Park in Waterford. And he'd say, and, right, Cowd would be there. And, you know, you'd get the ball and there'd be a 60, 60 metre ball taken over. And Cowd would just look to the left, take the ball down with his left foot without even looking at it. Be hearing this is the way the, the your your people pass on stories and you'd hear you know epic stories about you know let's say Code's first touch and the fact that he he was just a gifted player and so I played football and I was a, a dribbler I was an inside forward uh, or not an inside an inside left sided midfielder didn't have much pace wasn't able to tackle but I was good on the ball and uh, I think I was the captain of the 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 under twelves team at one stage and uh, but it was a it was a the training games were different from the real matches because I'm sure a lot of Irish people out there who've played football would recognise what I'm about to say next. And you got about a minute play, to say it. You play this game and you play in the training match and you dribble through everybody and score a goal and then you that would be training and then you come to the match on Saturday and the minute you get the ball in the centre you just hear this thunderous screech from your manager on the sideline. Get rid of it, Mario! Get rid of it! Get, get rid of it, Mario! The ball was a hot potato that you weren't allowed to have in Irish football. Get rid of it as soon as possible. And of course, a lot of people will recognise what I'm talking about there because we weren't encouraged to keep the ball. Tippy-tappy it was not. It sounds like Tippy-tappy. the Jack Tar- Charlton era, Mario, was uh, even before it actually happened. Uh, oh, 53106, no. we got more with Mario Rosen's talk. Great chat after the break. 53106 for any text you have for Mario. Off the ball on News Talk. This Irish success story is brought to you by Guaranteed Irish. Who would have thought from humble beginnings in a small town butcher shop in the 1880s that Clonakilty black pudding would be exported around the world today? Supporting 50 jobs in the seaside town of West Cork, this family business and its famous recipe has become a local treasure, putting Clonakilty on the global food map. Guaranteed Irish helps you support companies that are altogether better choices for our communities. So look out for it. Guaranteedirish.ie. Altogether better. There's never been a better time to get Air's totally unlimited broadband for just $29.99 a month for 12 months. Sign up today and you'll also get thousands of movies, TV series and amazing Amazon originals on Amazon Prime Video. On us for a whole year. For more on this amazing offer, call 1-800-500-300 or visit air.ie. Air. Let's make possible. Price for new customers. 12-month contract subject to availability. Bundle activation fee may apply. Full details and terms. See air.ie forward slash prime video. 
COVID-19 is a major public health emergency here in Ireland and around the world. It's having a big impact on the way we live our lives, how we stay connected as communities and how we use open spaces. If you are planning on heading out into the fresh air, here are five things to remember. 1. Stay local, within two kilometres of home. 2. Keep a distance of two metres from others. 3. Go out with members of your own household only. 4. Always enjoy the outdoors with consideration and respect for the people you meet along the way. And 5. Wash your hands before you leave home and always observe coughing and sneezing etiquette. Find out more at gov.ie. Supported by the Government of Ireland. Switch to SSE Electricity and get an incredible 26% off your home electricity. Switch today and join the thousands of Irish homes and businesses sourcing their power from 100% green energy. Get your 26% discount today. Free phone 1800 818 466. This is a great deal. This is Generation Green. EAB 879 euro 22 cent. Offer from 20th November 2019. Rates valid from 3rd of December 2018. Subject to change. One year standard unit rate discount for new home electricity customers on direct debit and e-bill. For details of T's and C's, EAB exit fees. FBD Insurance Group Limited. Trading as FBD Insurance is regulated by the Central Bank of Ireland. At Centra, we have everything you need with great offers. Like Centra Fresh Irish Chicken Fillets, 680 gram, save 33%, now 6 euro 3 cent. Kellogg's Rice Krispies, 510 gram, and Corn Flakes, 720 gram, 3 euro 50 each. And Fado Friendship Reserva Wine, now only 10 euro. Centra, live every day. Enjoy call sensibly. With our network of Irish, British, and international reporters, The Sunday Times is your reliable source for news and opinion on the pandemic that's changing our world. Even if you're at home, you can stay in touch by subscribing to our seven-day digital package for just five euro a month, with the first month free. Sign up today at thetimes.ie forward slash join. The Lotto Jackpot is an estimated 9.8 million euro. If you'd like to play any of your favorite national lottery games from home, just download the app or visit lottery.ie. Play responsibly, play for fun. It always feels better to go direct. Sam learned that the hard way when he asked Emily to ask Tom who knew Alan who knew Sarah to ask Emma to the Debs. Uh, Sam who? Uh, going direct is always the best way to go, especially when it comes to switching to Energia and Ireland's cheapest dual fuel bundle. Come to us directly and you'll get the biggest savings with a 35% discount on gas and a 36% saving on electricity. Visit energia.ie. Energia, the power behind your savings. EAB 1,493 euro based on average annual usage, 12-month contract, discounted unit rate, standing charge, PSO levy and carbon tax, T's and C's and early termination fee apply. Valid from January 2020 and subject to change. Verification and T's and C's at energia.ie forward slash EAB. Get with the program. Update the News Talk app now in the App Store or Google Play Store. Across Ireland. Across Ireland. This is the Imro Radio Awards Station of the Year. This, this is News Talk. It's two o'clock that afternoon. I'm Stephen Murphy. The health watchdog is to carry out urgent inspections of nursing homes due to the COVID-19 crisis. Another 44 patients with coronavirus died yesterday, bringing the death toll to 530. There have been 335 outbreaks in residential care settings where a census of all deaths so far this year is being carried out. HICWA has also been asked to put, to get, to put together a checklist of items for all nursing homes next week to tackle the problem. Problem. Health Minister Simon Harris says the watchdog will visit facilities the following week to make sure those measures are in place. My main obligation is not to any one individual nursing home or any institutions, to the people living in them. It's to our Irish people living in those nursing homes, our residents, our friends, our families. So I think the HICWA standards, if you want to call them that, or framework, is, is, a, is a really important development. A review has been ordered by the Taoiseach into travel restrictions at ports and airports. It's after criticism of Keeling's Fruit, who flew nearly 200 workers into the country to pick strawberries. Leo Varadkar says he shares the concerns of the Chief Medical Officer that bringing the workers in went against public health advice. Keeling's insists they were screened by doctors doctors in their home country before flying here. Sinn Féin health spokesperson Louise O'Reilly says the government should have seen this coming. Every year hundreds of workers, if not thousands, come here for the harvest, uh, to work through the harvest. So of course 
the government knew about it. This is not a surprise. This should not have come as a shock uh, to the government, but they are acting uh, as if they are surprised or shocked by the news, which I think is very troubling. The gunman who killed Lyra McKee took more than just one life when he pulled the trigger a year ago. That's the message from the sister of the murder journalist, Nicola Corner. Today marks a year since the 29-year-old was killed during riots in the Cregan area of Derry. The day they killed our wee Lyra, they destroyed a part of each of us. And what makes it all even worse is that Lyra's murder literally killed our mother on the 10th of March. You know, she just could not live without her baby. She just couldn't accept that Lear had been killed. And finally, global stars will join forces tonight from their homes around the world in a concert for healthcare workers on the front line of the COVID-19 pandemic. One World Together at Home will feature performances from the Rolling Stones, Paul McCartney and Lady Gaga, who curated the concert. It's set to air live online and on TV and radio stations worldwide from 7pm Irish time. It's two minutes past two. News Talk Weather. Thanks to the AA. To help in these challenging times, we've reduced the cost of our home insurance. Get our lowest price at the AA.ie. Some outbreaks of rain and drizzle today, but it'll be mainly cloudy in most areas, staying cooler than recent days with highs of 11 to 13 degrees. And now you're up to date on News Talk. Off the ball. This This is News Talk. This is Off the Ball Saturday on News Talk. John Duggan with you through till 5 o'clock. 53106 for your text messages. You're also streaming live as well on our social channels, uh, on YouTube, on Facebook, and on Twitter. At Off the Ball on Twitter is our handle. Uh, Our special guest this week is Mario Rosenstock, the Today FM National Institution for two decades, the comedian, the actor, the impressionist, the 13 time winner of IMRO Radio Awards. And Mario, we had a great chat between one and two, talking about your love of Roger Federer, how you do mm. impressions, the masters, our, our love of golf. Um, mm. And you were decent enough to come on the visual, uh, not in a suit or in your, in your, in a, your tra- in a track suit or in your pajamas, mm. but you got this, uh, looks like a Celtic jersey. Tell us about that. All right. So the Celtic jersey, John, I had a few jerseys up in the up in my uh, wardrobe there. And this t- jersey is very, very special because it is a Celtic jersey given to me by Roy Keane. Oh, and it was given to me by Roy Keane and signed by Keno. There it is. Wow, signed by Keno for me um, when he was at Celtic. And this was, of course, uh, that led to because my meeting with Roy Keane and uh, the Irish Guide Dogs for the Blind. So basically, we agreed to do loads of stuff. Myself and Ian um, did the show down with the Irish Guide Dogs for the Blind. These beautiful dogs and these lovely little uh, cuddly. Uh, creatures and the ferocious uh, velociraptor that is Roy Keane and um, later then the guide dogs people said oh no Roy would be well on for um, meeting you and Ian and doing uh, you know meeting meeting Mario and doing the thing and so I met Roy Keane and I've told that story a lot but uh, I suppose the thing that came across to me more about Roy Keane than anything else um, is how aware he is of show business Um, he really gets it he is a performer um, he's as sharp, um, bright, uh, whip smart, and um, he's quick off the mark, um, but he gets showbiz, baby. Does that, does that mean as, there's a contrivance as, there in any way? I wouldn't say it's a contrivance. He gets it. He knows the playing field. He gets the playing field of show business um, as much as he gets the, he got the playing field of football. Like if you, if, you want, if you want an example of that, go on to YouTube and watch a... You may be aware of it, John. Go on to YouTube and wear, watch a, a an interview that uh, Keane does to promote the second coming of his book with Kevin Kilban for Football Focus. And it's Keane in his Mahmoud Abmudinejad phase <laughs> crossed with Tommy Tiernan where he's got this gigantic terrorist beard on him. And, uh, uh, right? and he's got these manic wide eyes. And Kevin Kilban is just trying to ask him a question. So Kevin Kimball might ask him a question. Roy goes on a 10-minute performance, basically, going, you know, and it's stuff like, people think, you know, at the end of the day, that I'm a monster. I'm not a monster at the end of the day, Kevin. I'm far from it. I'm a monster. I'll go off and I'll eat you alive. I won't do that. And the beard is flying all over his and the eyes are... He knows damn well he's on BBC and that he's on Football Focus and the people will be going, look at Keno, he's gone mad. He was perfectly well aware of what he's doing. Um, and it's his... It's his sense of self-awareness that I think is interesting. His self-knowledge. 
the fact that he understands the effect that he's having on other people around him that I think makes Keane very interesting. And uh, were you nervous meeting him? Did you find him intimidating? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. All, all of those things, John. I mean, let's be, I know all credit to cliches, but these, <laughs> <laughs> you know, these, there are some cliches that you just can't get around. Keane is, is, he's got a ferocious command of his own presence. Um, it was only when I first met him that I seemed I realized that his eyes were a kind of a hazily green, it seemed to me. When he shook my hands, he squeezed my hand so that it, it hurt. His hands were slim and bony um, with an extremely strong grip. And he looked straight through you into your eyes as if to go, don't mess with me today. <laughs> and if you do, I'll do you. You actually did do him. You did impressions of him. You did Roy yeah, as Roy. I did. So he, he, <laughs> instead of him doing me, I did him. But the point was that he got it. I see people don't. It, it, it's hard for people to understand. I did an impression of Roy Keane with Roy Keane. Roy Keane stayed in character as I pretended to be him. So he didn't go. Ah, oh, there's a lad doing an impression of me now. I was there like, oh, how's it going? And he's there. How's it going? <laughs> <laughs> so, absolutely insanity. Two Roy Keanes talking to each other. And um, with Ian in the middle with the little with the microphone, and um, so it was really mad and um, and but uh, uh, and, and a very impressive uh, person, and he's smart and quick, and uh, and he has a natural intelligence intelligence about him. Uh, uh, Neil has been in touch. It's fair to say I'd rather listen to Gift Grub Mario talk about sport and off the ball with John Duggan than his comedy. I don't know if that's a, a backhand compliment. Um, great analysis. Yeah, it same is a with, compliment. Same when you're on with Joe um, Molloy recently. Yeah. Uh, well done to both of you. Really enjoying the chat with Mario. Light relief in these tragic times. That's from Ursula. Uh, could you ask Mario the name of that article from the New York Times about Federer again? That is from Carl. Yeah, it's called Federer as a Religious Experience and you'll get it on the internet um, in full. You won't have to dial into the, you won't have to pay, subscribe, go behind the f- paywall or anything. You'll, you'll, you'll get it. It's a beautiful, beautiful article. Um, and this guy, David Foster Wallace, was a, a bit of a genius writer himself and a successful young, junior tennis player. Um, but there's something about tennis. Do you know, we talked about golf earlier on. There is yeah. something about tennis. Um, from my own per- personal point of view, from the moment you pick up a tennis racket, and it impacts with the tennis ball for the first time and you hit it through the center of the racket. There is a huge kinetic pleasure involved. It's a feel of a projectile being um, hurled, like a, I'm sure a hurley and a slither is similar, or a golf ball and, 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 a, and a driver, but there is a sense of, of, of a projectile being um, a hurled. And then there is this, the the the... the, the the court and the court, it seems to me, well, it's different to hurling or football or rugby where everybody's screaming in tennis. The court is quiet. It's silent. It's like a theater. Um, and in the theater, there are two performers. And I say my line, namely, I serve and he says his line. And I say my line back and he says his line back. And for me, it's it's like drama, it's like film, it's like theatre. And at the end, the audience clap. So it, it only occurred to me many years after playing tennis that actually one of the things I loved about tennis was that I was on stage and that I was in the theatre. And that's why, of course, obviously I graduated towards theatre because it's a, it's, it's, a, it's a type of tennis and tennis is a type of theatre. Um, it's a beautiful, beautiful sport. Um, you and your notes you asked me as well you were you you were saying you had a peculiar thing you said Mario tennis is one of those games you told me that people can throw throw a match yeah well, you were saying that to me and, and I'm kind of thinking with somebody's 4-1 down and they're just going to throw it away and you think you're throwing away in the middle of a sport in, 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 and then I realised they're saving energy they're they're willing to let something go and they're not willing yeah. to claw back there's, and make it 7-5 there's, there's there's two things there's two there's two elements involved one is there's a guy there's a tennis player called Bernard Tomic I presume you're aware of him yeah um, and Bernard Tomic is kind of reviled within the game of tennis by fellow tennis players for being a spoiled brat. But he's also re- renowned for tanking in games. And tanking is, I suppose, uh, a slightly tennis term for throwing a match, not trying and giving up and losing. And it's a disgraceful thing to do for a tennis player, a professional tennis player or any sportsman to throw a game. But within this subject is a different subject. And that is the idea of giving up in a certain set letting the set go so that you can maintain your energy um, for the next set. And that happens frequently in tennis. 
You see it all the time. A player is two breaks down in the third set, in the in the second, in the third set, and they just go, "I'm not going to win this third set, so I'm just going to preserve my energy and start to set, start serving in the fourth set." And that happens all the time, and it happens with Federer, and it happens with Nadal, happens with all the great players. So um, yeah, they, it's it's a bit like. Um, the Rumble in the Jumble, Jungle, 1974 with Ali and Foreman. I mean, it's clear that Ali is throwing all those rounds, rounds four, five, six, and seven. And then in round eight, he unleashes. Well, it was a method to the madness there. there exactly. Madness. So, so, so if he can so stay alive, he's going to win stay, the fight. Exactly. Stay um, alive. I always felt that um, you can't beat Novak Djokovic by fighting him. He's a wall. You can't, you can't beat a wall. And I had a bizarre theory about how to beat Novak Djokovic because I want Federer to beat him so much when he plays him in five set matches. If you play Djokovic in a five set match and the first set lasts an hour and 20 minutes and you win 7-6, Djokovic is still going to win the match because he's, he's just going to outlast you. He's just physically superior. So I always thought that one of the cleverest ways you could possibly beat Djokovic is concede the first two sets, 6-love, six 6-love six in 20 minutes and then just go, all I have to do now is win the last three sets and it might take three hours, but it'll only be three hours because the concept of playing Novak Djokovic for six hours, yeah. you're not going to win. He's you're not going to win. You know, he's a cyborg, so you're not going to win. So just give him the first two sets. Yeah. That's, that's a bit nuts now, right? It is a bit Give nuts. him the first two sets. Six love, six love, and then go, right, I'm ready to play. All I have to do is win the last three sets, but at least I'm okay. fresh. <laughs> we, 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 we nearly have to wrap it up, Mario. You've been great to talk to us today on Off the Ball Saturday. Uh, just um, Liverpool fans, there's a lot of them out there. In 2005, they beat AC Milan in that uh, Champions League final in Istanbul, one of the probably the most memorable Champions League final ever when they were 3 0 down. They won on penalties. I was in Brussels at the time. Uh, and I got a bit tired and emotional. I started singing You'll Never Walk Alone as a Tottenham fan, and then I found 50 euro on the ground in Brussels. It was one of those just weird nights. Um, but I remember you telling me this off air, and I just think it was just mad what you did. You're a Liverpool fan. What did you do when uh, Dudek saved Shevchenko's penalty? Well, earlier in the game, I started flicking over to EastEnders. I was just so, <laughs> I was just so, I don't know if any other Liverpool fans did that. I was just so disappointed and so let down. And I know that a lot of Liverpool fans left the stadium um, at halftime. Um, and then I re rejoined the match and Stevie G playing it right full. And, you know, then the, the, the penalties. And when we won... <laughs> I just started throwing cups and smashing everything in the kitchen. <laughs> I couldn't think of any other way to express the release. I just got cups and I just started smashing them off the window and the wall and the mirror. And blonde, my wife came in and she she thought there was a murder going on in my in the house. She thought somebody was being murdered, and um, it was the only way I could express myself by throwing stuff, by smashing stuff. Uh, because of I was just so over so exhilarated, but I've always loved Liverpool, and you and I went to see Liverpool Manchester United, John, and I I, I cherish that day. Um, a beautiful stadium and human solidarity, John. This is why I love Liverpool. Human solidarity, especially this time as well. So, something about the people of Liverpool, yeah, the union tradition, standing up for each other, the working man, the sense of humour. Human solidarity. It's why I support the Liverpool Football Club as much as their simple devotion to pass and move and the Shankly um, uh, model. Uh, it's simplicity, but it's also human solidarity that L Liverpool sort of people stick together and their community. It's they're involved in community. And I think that if, if one word we need to listen to um, these days now is community and human solidarity. We need to be there for each other. We need to put our arms around each other, put our arms around each other's shoulders. Well, maybe not when we get past the social distancing, yeah, yeah, yeah. virtually put arms around each yeah. other's shoulders and take care of each other. And that's what I love about the idea of Liverpool. Mario, you're a great man. It's been a blast talking to you for the last hour and thanks so much. I've really enjoyed it, John. Thank you so much. Mario Rosenstock there, legend, national institution. You can get the podcast of that on offtheball.com later on. 53106 for your text messages here. We're chatting to canoeist Jenny Egan after this. Off the Ball on News Talk. On Alive and Kicking.